Okay. So, all right. So this is a chapter, chapter six, about when, when p-dimensional hyperplanes are just too much and you need to be less than p-dimensional or something like that. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So the context is that we're, we think that the relationship between our outcome variable and all the regressors is linear or is well approximated by a linear model, but that the number of features is approaching in, is around in, is very coincidentally exactly in, or is greater than in. And that's going to present some problems. Um, so if we think about the problems in terms of the prediction error, by assumption, the problem is not high bias. We assume that we have low bias because again, bias in this case would mean that it's the outcome is not a linear function of the predictors. But there can be a lot of variance in those estimates when p is getting close to n. Um, and when it can be, it can just be meaningless when p is n, or it can be impossible to fit this model when p is greater than n. And so, so one of the benefits, so I'm actually take this away, one of the benefits of um, things that we're going to discuss today and next week or next year are that uh, we can reduce the variance and make some models possible that would have not otherwise been possible. And another benefit that the authors point out that I have a question mark next to, because um, I want other people's opinions on, uh, is that model interpretability, interpretability will go up. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know what you guys think about this, but linear models are pretty interpretable and they don't really become more interpretable as you have fewer predictors in the sense that, you know, I don't know if any of you ever had like a stats class where you spend a week just learning to say, holding all other variables constant at the end of interpreting any coefficient in a linear model context. But uh, I've had that. And like what that drilled into me is that you can really focus on, I mean, if you're interpreting something, that's really like an exercise in narrative more than an exercise in uh, statistics in some, in some way, My at least, you know, in this case. My recollection from reading this chapter is that some of these methods preserve an interpretability and some don't. So I don't know if it was like these methods improve it. It's just one of the considerations in looking at these various methods. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? Or do I move on? I can't see anyone. So, so I'm just going to do a time thing after like three seconds go by. Well, uh, yeah, I think... Um... Like there, there is some scale to it, but you're right that it can be interpreted. It's just a matter of, you know, if you have a thousand variables, technically you can interpret what all of them mean, but it's it's still harder to understand than if there are three. You know, right, right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's just a, a sheer number type thing. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. So with that, we can actually start. We can look at the. I'm just going to go in order. Uh, and so 6.1 is about subset, select, subset selection. Um, and I just thought the way that they say it is just perfect. So I didn't want to try to improve it. Um, and so the, the first, there are different subset selection algorithms. And in best subset selection, um, as they say, we fit separate least squares regressions for uh, regression best subset for each possible combination of the p predictors. Okay, and it's a lot of models, um, but uh, but the general algorithm, and I'll spell it out in more explicitly in a second, is that at you know the first step, um, again p is the number of predictors, so we fit all p models. Why do you think selection anyway? P models that contain exactly one predictor, and then p choose two predictors. That contain uh, two predictors and so forth. And so to kind of recapitulate, you start with the null model, which is intercept only. And you denote it funny m sub zero uh, or m naught. And then for, for you know, you have you let k index over the, the number of predictors. Um, you fit P choose K models at each step containing K predictors. And then you just, whichever one is the best, you denote M sub K. And then um, here, 
this changes depending on what kind of model it is. So it would be lowest residual sum of squares. If it's a linear model, it could be lowest deviance if you're doing something fit with, uh, I don't know, if you're doing a Poisson model or a logit model. Uh, and then, but so, so then you have M sub, you know, you have the null model all the way to M sub P. So you have to choose among those models. And there you have to use a different criterion. Uh, and you have a lot of criteria at your disposal and we'll probably get into that, and we hopefully will. Um, so then best those defined by one of those different criteria, such as Marlowe's CP, the BIC, the Bayesian information criterion, the Kaiki uh, information criterion, and you have options. Okay, so one of the things is when you see something like P choose K, right? I mean, ah, well, I'm gonna do that first. I'll come back to the slide. So, you know, at, at the first step, if you're just looking at like the, the credit data set, which they use in this book, um, you know, first step, you're testing out 11 models, but it, it goes up quite a bit, you know, 55 models in your second step for when you're looking at best three projector models, you're testing out 165, 330, 462, uh, and then, you know, it's a binomial thing. So it's gonna triangulate back down, but in the end, even for a model where dimensionality is not really a problem, uh, you're testing a lot of models. And um, now I'm going to gracefully go back to this slide. Um, this is what that, that looks like. And so this is actually from the credit data set. And you see what, what happens here is that every dot is a fit model. And it is its residual sum of squares on the left plot. It's as far squared on the right-hand plot, and you have the number of predictors as you go rightward. Um, and yeah, and it's just, they, they call this red line a, a frontier. So it's the best model frontier, I suppose. And, um, you know, it's quite a few, there, there are, I guess, probably two important trends to note. One is that it is monotonically decreasing. Uh, for residual sum squares, monotonically increasing for R squared. And another feature of it is that the slope is not the same, or sort of like the, the secant lines connecting the dots are, are, are not of the same slope, right? So there's a big drop between one and two and two and three. Again, I'm looking at the left-hand plot. Uh, and then it's pretty flat. Um, so it's the it's going down, but it's too hard to perceive. So those are two consequences we'll flesh out in a bit. Um, but all right, let's let's switch that and make a thing about the pros of this. Um, unsurprisingly, the, the best sorry, a pro of um, best subset selection is that it selects the best subset. I think that's pretty nice. Uh, some contrast, some cons. It can lead to overfitting. Um, and when you have really high dimensional models, which is, but, but there are ways you can guard against it. Um, one thing that I failed to put in the slides, but I should have is there's a, there are also rules, not rules, there are heuristics for selecting simpler models than even the algorithm would tell you. There's a one standard DV, or sorry, one standard error rule. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to remember to, to say that again in the section on selecting among the sort of the best models at each number of predictors. Um, so overfitting is still be a problem. And one thing that I, I was thinking about is I personally don't know if there's a correct way. And again, someone please pipe up if there is a correct way to incorporate polynomial terms and interactions. Um, so I mean, what, what if you have, you know, your credit data set and you want to start putting in some squared terms, some interactions, you just, you know, do I say like, do you just do, do it the Nike way and just do it or? So like is there polynomials for every possible combination of those? Like, wouldn't that be a huge growth of the the space? It would be. It would be a quite large growth. But I know that there are domains in which it's very common to square every term. So you fit. So every model has its quadratic in there, and there's a pairwise interaction between every variable, uh, between every explanatory variable. So. People do do that, and it's not a new thing either. I mean, this is like something that goes back to the 
1960s when I was just a small kid. So, uh, so it's a thing that people do. And I don't know if, if these two fields are in communication at all, but it, it occurred to me as I was thinking about, you know, applying this to my own, to my own work. Um, so anyway, so it's just, it's just a note. It's an, un, it's a thing that I don't know yet. Um, but it's something that, that maybe some algorithms do, like some program, um, some packages in R, they take care of it in some principled way. Um, and the other thing is that, um, another con, con is that this can be computationally expensive, especially as you get actually into situations where P is getting close to N and N is also relatively large. So with that, so, so it's kind of incumbent upon us as practitioners to think about uh, ways to reduce the computational expense and want us to use a slightly different algorithm, uh, which I <laughs> very helpfully did not actually put the name of. I realize now as I see its acronym, but it's a forward stepwise subset selection. And um, it starts off exactly the same. So you have M naught denoting null model with no predictors, intercept only. And then you're going to kind of go for each value of, you're going to iterate this process, this algorithm for each value of K, which again is number of predictors that are in the model. And the difference is that you don't test all combinations of, you know, P choose K. Um, you do P minus K minus one predictors that are not in K minus one. And that's a lot of subscripts and indices I'm throwing at you. So, um, so, I'll, so we'll just start with uh, M sub one, right? Uh, say that you had 100 predictors, right? Um, we'll just we're stipulate that. And then uh, at K equals one, you know, K minus one, uh, that term goes to zero. And so you test P models and 100 predictors. You test 100 predictors that are not in K minus one, which again, I'm sorry for the sub, sub uh, indices and stuff, but k minus one at k would be, or at k equals one would be zero. See, I'm even confusing myself. A lot of stuff, but the important point is that it, it, it works out and you end up basically um, testing, you have the, the model that you established at m k minus one, and then you are testing all the predictors not in that model. Um, to see which one adds the most, right? And so and that's what this says here. So you select a predictor that raises, and again, I guess I'm just assuming it's a, a linear model that raises R squared the most and add it to MK minus one to create MK. And then the third step is the same as with best subset selection. Um, and so again, uh, instead of listing out the specific the various different techniques. I just say you want to minimize validation error or some estimate of it. Okay, so that's that. And then there's one more. Oh, yeah. And then so this is just a comparison again in a relatively low dimensional setting. So in the first step, we're going to test out 11 models as just as we did in best subset selection. But then the numbers start to change quite a bit. Here you test up only 10 instead of 55 for the best two predictor model, and then nine, seven, 165 for the best three predictor model. And the differences become even more drastic until, uh, until they stop becoming more dramatic. But yeah, so it's uh, quite, a, it's much smaller number of models that are, are looked at. And, you know, here they say, again, just quoting from the text, that when the number of predictors is 20, the best subset, so best subset selection requires fitting, you know, over a million models, uh, whereas forward step by selection requires fitting only 211. Um, and I'm going to go over this one just really quick. People talk about it less. Um, so there's best, I'm sorry, backwards uh, stepwise, so yeah, backwards stepwise subset selection, uh, which they typically don't <laughs> mention this. But one thing you do have to do with uh, this one, so it has a zeroth step, uh, and it's just to make sure that um, n is greater than p. Uh, maybe in some implementations there's a way around this, but uh, I'm unaware of them. So backwards is just the opposite of forwards, as uh, most English speakers know. And so intuitively that's what this does, is it starts with the full model, so the null model, and um, I'm not going to go over with the indices and subscripts and stuff, but 
Oh, yes, it does the same thing, but backwards, just removing variables and seeing which one kind of hurts the less, or it hurts the least as you remove it. And then you, you know, make that K minus one and you work down to the null model. Okay. Um, so just, you know, in summary for these two is they perform one in the book titled guided searches. And one thing that I found, I, I, I'm editorializing here, it's a very fun footnote, is, um, and this is just focusing on forward stepwise selection. So, you know, this idea between, this idea, this contrast between a, um, the, the, the literal number of models that are looked at and the effective search space, or the effective model space considered, uh, you know, which it makes sense because it's, you know, optimized each step. It's not like a random, uh, you know, P times P plus one divided by two plus one. Um, so I thought that was a, uh, just an interesting comment. Perhaps no one else does, but I found it interesting. So I'm glad they put it in the book. Um, and then another thing that I don't note here in words is that uh, table 6.1 shows something that is useful uh, for practitioners of this, is that um, best subset and forward stepwise can diverge, and so can backward stepwise, but it's not fiction. Um, so what you can see is that they have the same uh, one predictor model because rating was just the one, I mean, the best improvement on the null model. And then at step two, rating and income come into the credit model. At step three, both agree rating income student. And then at step four, things change. Um, so rating actually gets dropped and income student limit are there for, uh, for the best subset, and, um, and and rating can't fall out of the forward stepwise subset selection because that's just not allowed because we're always adding, we're creating M sub K uh, based on M K minus one. So, um, and so, you know, there's, there's some past dependence in forward stepwise, select, forward stepwise subset selection that's not present in best subset selection. So, so yeah, so they can diverge and, you know, who knows what uh, backward stepwise selection would be saying at this point. I guess I could have actually done it, uh, but I, I, was, I was delinquent in my duties as a presenter, so shame on me. Uh, but, but anyway, so does anyone have any questions about that so far? Because now we're going to talk about how you choose between the M sub K models and you're wondering why is this book on the shelf of code? It's because you have to punish models. You have to discipline your modeling procedure. You have to punish your models for the number of predictors they have. That's why that looks there. So how do you do it? Well, remember this graph. I told you I'd come back to it. Um, so the RSS decreases and the R squared increases as you go from, you know, whatever K is from MK to M. So as you know, the number of predictors grows. So, and this means that MP will, always win that contest um, if we let RSS or R squared decide. Um, and so that's that's not good because we don't get any of the goals, like we don't accomplish any of the goals that we originally wanted with finding a subset, right? Assuming we want like a proper subset of the, the variables. So so these criteria, no, no good. Um, right, that's what I just said. Um, so yeah, so what we need to do is estimate the test error. And this is something that in the book they've been emphasizing since uh, either the first or second chapter is that test, or sorry, training error is not a good estimate of test error. And that's what we're concerned with. Um, so I'm just gonna go through these really quickly. Um, this is Marlowe's C, maybe it's CP. When you say it out loud, I don't know. Um, and yeah, I'll get to that in a second. So basically what you see is that model goodness, and this is a measure of model goodness, uh, here is not solely defined in terms of residual sum of squares, but also has this kind of strange looking second term, which is two times the number of predictors in the model, that's what K is, and the book they use D. I'm not sure why they switch from D to K. If anyone has any insight to that, I would be, uh, I would be interested in knowing, because I switched it back to K for consistency. Um, and then, that is multiplied by an estimate of the error, which, um, so yeah, so 
exactly what it is. It's an estimate of the variance of the error, epsilon, associated with each response. I mean, so yeah, so it's, it's the estimate of the error in each prediction. Um, and, you know, if you want, I mean, it, you notice it has a hat, so it's an, it's an estimate. Um, and uh, so it's typically estimated using full model, all predictors. And, you know, one thing that notice uh, is that, I mean, if you think about it, it's an estimator, so it can approach what's estimating either biasedly, which is a new adverb in the English language, or unbiasedly. And you want to pray for the latter. But, you know, if you don't want to pray, uh, then you can use um, cross validation. So, so you can do that. Um, here they talk about um, in the book. They also mention that the AIC is the same as CP in the um, the OLS situation, which is is pretty cool because if you look at the original format, which I've put in the slides, they don't look that similar. Um, so that just shows you one of the great mysteries of, of statistics that, that if you do this, if you work it out, somehow those come out to be the same thing in the OLS situation. Uh, but that's not something I'm going to dwell on here. Um, but you can see again, by the I mean, so you have um, K fe features in there. Um, so number of predictors is taken into account. And just real quick, just going to breeze through this. Another one is the PIC. Again, you're taking uh, K. One thing that they, they, they mentioned in the book is that the log of N, so like your sample size, is going to quickly, so just, I should have put these on the same slide. Um, if you look at the, if you compare the AIC and the BIC, the second term is the same. So the minus two log of the model's likelihood. Um, what's different is the first term is that um, for the AIC, the log sample size was, um, was uh, and where that is, was a two. And so no, the, basically the, the long of it, the, the short of it is that the BIC is gonna punish um, predictors more than uh, it's going to predict punish predictors more than the AIC will. So, well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, and then also, there's adjusted R squared for linear models. And, it, and it's a if it doesn't seem obvious immediately, uh, which it probably won't, like exactly how this punishes predictors, it just it's useful like insert some concrete numbers into there and you'll say, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so yeah. So let's see this. Um, oh, and lastly, before I come to some nice pictures, um, what if you want to avoid all of these adjustment methods, right? And I think that's that's actually a useful thing just to go back a second. So notice that they all take some measure of model's goodness, like it's log likelihood, uh, it's residual sum of squares, it always features in there, but there's some way of adjusting that number to account for the number of predictors. So that's why they're called adjustment methods. But what if you want to avoid them? Um, like why, why would you want to avoid them? Um, so the estimate of the, the error, the prediction error can be hard to come by. Um, model in complex models, the degrees of freedom can be hard to come by. Um, and then adjustment methods make assumptions about the true model. And that kind of relates to this first point about getting unbiased estimates of the prediction error. So the answer is to cross validate. Um, and so you know you, you create your you do your resampling and then you just fit um, the the models. And so and, and you just look for the best, you know, you want to minimize uh, Valid, you know, cross validated MSC or something like that. Uh, and yeah, I'll leave it there for that. And so, what, what this is showing is, you know, that exercise happening. Um, so, all the models that sort of lost their intra predictor competition have been discarded from these graphs, and only the winners remain. And you're just looking for what minimizes, you know, depending on the case, either minimizes or maximizes the model. Uh, goodness criterion. And one thing that is, of course, interesting to point out, I think, is that there's quite the, I mean, it's okay. So we, we got, we have six here, you know, this is all using the same data. So you have a six predictor model here. We have a four predictor model here. Here we have a seven predictor model for adjusted R squared. 
Um, so that is a tricky thing. There's no reason to think that they're going to give you the same um, the same result. Um, so that is that, that is a fun a fun thing, and I'm pretty sure there's no principled way to choose between these. Um, let's see, what's the next thing would be? Yeah. So one technique they mentioned in the book is using a one standard error rule. And so what you do is you find the, you find what, you know, I'll just use adjusted R squared here. So you find the number of predictors that maximizes adjusted R squared. And then you notice that it's also, it's pretty flat before this. And so you'll not only look at the, the maximum, but you'll, you'll find a standard error. So uh, let's say you did, uh, let's say you did um, cross validation. So you should have a, a standard error of that estimate. And then you say anything that is simpler, uh, any model that is simpler, but is still within one standard error of that estimate is actually the model I'll take. So you perform an extra simplification step. Um, and so that would, I assume, get you back to the four, maybe a three predictable model. I don't know. I don't know what the, that uncertainty estimate would look like. But so that's something that I, again, I, I failed to put in the slides, but is, uh, is at least useful enough that it appears in the, it's like there's a baked in function for, the, for that in the uh, tidy models package. Okay, so I'm gonna conclude this because it's already gone quite long, it's gone on quite a long time. Uh, so like, what do we do? We discarded redundant or noise features. A, theoretically, this is an algorithm that will just do it for us with no knowledge of what we're trying to model. Um, <clears throat> as the previous slide was different estimates of test error return different optima. Um, and this is something that I actually hadn't thought about until I, until I read it, um, is that when you do this, so for example, you know, when we do the labs, you'll, we'll see that um, like the output for this, um, at least for how, how this algorithm is implemented in R, will return actual predictors and you know, uh, parameter estimates for those predictors. But that's actually not what you're doing. You're not finding a set of predictors when you do this exercise. You're tuning complexity. And you're not finding a particular set of predictors. So what you would actually do is you would find the best complexity and then with, let's say, let's say you did cross-validation and then you refit the model at that level of complexity um, using probably the same algorithm, um, but on the full training data set. And you might actually get you know, and it's not unlikely that you would get a different subset of predictors. It's just there to be the same number of predictors. And so that was kind of wild, I thought. Um, but it, it, it actually kind of unites um, subset selection with any other parameter that you would tune because a lot of tuning parameters are complexity parameters. So I thought that was, that was an interesting way to make this method more similar to other machine learning methods. And that's it for that. So. Uh, so that's all until we come back to the lab. So now we're in shrinkage methods, right? So we're, we're shrinking things. Um, I assume everyone's laughing right now. Um, so so what, what, what's up with shrinkage? Um, so, so shrinkage will reduce the variance and can, that's in italics, um, perhaps should have been in parentheses, uh, it can perform variable selection. Um, in the book, they write, you know, there's a substantial reduction in variance for a slight increase in bias. So that's why it's worth it. You get more than it takes. Um, the trade-off is good. And it achieves these good things, these desiderata, as people in philosophy used to say, uh, by penalizing parameters. Okay, so let's get into the concrete nuts and bolts. Oh, yeah. And then one way you can think of it, this penalization process, just depending on the degree of penalization, uh, you know, maximum penalization would give you the null model, no, no, no penalization would give you the OLS estimate, and then you have like the whole territory between those two. Okay, so just as a recap, um, what is an OLS estimate? Again, we're doing linear models, right? Um, although these methods apply to logistic as well, but um, this, this big mess uh, is just basically saying you take 
The OLS estimates are the estimates of the parameters that minimize the residual sum of squares. Okay, so, so we're going to take that as the base, but then we're going to say that these in ridge regression, um, the ridge regression estimates of the parameters are those parameters that minimize a new function, which is the RSS plus um, basically the, the, the sum of the squared parameters themselves. And notice, notice the lambda hanging out there. So what this means is that you have this term, you have the, the residual sum of squares, which you want to minimize. Like you see, just always, you know, it's, it's uh, the errors, the residuals. But then, you know, you typically would, I don't know, before this, before you are aware of shrinkage methods, you might have like a neutral attitude towards the magnitude of betas, but you throw them into this whole minimization scheme. And so now, you know, the algorithm is going to want to minimize those um, to, you know, depending on, on uh, lambda, the degree of minimization will change, but, but there it is. So, so that's like a new thing we're trying to minimize. Um, and yes, and so we're going to talk about lambda a little bit more, but yes, it's the tuning parameter, hyperparameter for the shrinkage penalty, which is, which is uh, this term, the summation over here. Okay. Um, oh yeah. And this is like fun quiz time. There's one model parameter that I, I say lambda, but anyway, there's one model parameter that doesn't, that doesn't feature in the shrinkage penalty. Does anyone want to, just so I can sip coffee for a second, does anyone want to hazard a guess as to what that is? The, the parameter lambda, right? Well, I, I'm, I'm not including lambda. It's not in okay. the, it's not in the uh, <laughs> I thought it was a trick question there because it looks like that's what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's not that, it's a, it's a beta. A beta it's zero, a, I guess. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that, that's what it is. So that was, uh, yeah, because you remember uh, at the beginning, I said that you're finding something between the null model and the full model. And the null model, of course, uh, is defined typically as having an intercept. So yes, so, so lambda is not going to shrink that. OK, so there it is, beta 0. Um, and what does it look like? Like, like what does this whole process of, of choosing a, a, a lambda look like? It uh, looks like this. So this is on the credit data set, and they've you know, highlighted the more interesting, well, just the more magnitudinous, I guess, regressors. Um, and you can see that as lambda increases, um, and here that happens on a log n scale, um, you know, they all eventually come towards zero. Um, and even the ones that they aren't, aren't featured uh, are shrinking. But, um, but yeah, so that's as lambda increases. They have another interesting axis. So this depicts really the exact same thing, but it's just the ratio of the, the ridge estimates to the, um, the so yeah, so the, the entire, yeah. Okay, so, so here's what, I mean, technically what it is, is the L2 norm of the ridge estimates divided by the L2 norm of the uh, OLS estimates. And yeah, so, so it's, you read it in reverse, right? So at one, these two, that means that the two are the same. So it's like, there's no penalty. And at zero, um, you know, that means the ridge estimates are, are zero because the denominator is constant. So, uh, so anyway, so this is a, an interesting graph to kind of like stare at for a second, but uh, time is not the luxury we have today. So I'm gonna move on. Um, so let's see what I wanna get at here. Okay, so, so this is the actual cross-validation exercise. So again, just to go back for a second, um, so these are just looking at what happens to coefficients, right? They shrink. It's a shrinkage method. That's what we're that's what we're talking about. Um, it's like what do you do with this? Is again we have the same x-axis here, respectively, you know, lambda and the ratio of the ridge estimates to the OLS estimates. And what you want to do is you want to minimize what they have here is the um, the MSE, yeah, the mean squared error estimate, right? And so yeah, so you just find a minimum. And that's, uh, that's hyperparameter tuning. And then you know they have uh, bias increasing. It's the black line. 
and they have variant, well, it's squared biased, and they have uh, variance decreasing, which is what you'd expect, right? So again, that's the whole point is that we're, we're we, there's this bias, bias variance trade-off that sets us at every step we take as people interested in machine learning. And um, so, yeah, so bias will increase, the variance will decrease, and we choose somewhere where, where we find a happy medium. Um, and just one thing I'll mention super briefly, hopefully, is that um, this looks like you need to fit a lot of models to do this. Um, you, know, you, you need a pretty fine grid over lambdas. Uh, but at least the, the algorithm in, in R, so Trevor Hasty is the, the, the maintainer of, uh, of that package, GLMnet. Uh, it's super fast. And without you giving any user input, we'll basically just create the numbers that would generate these graphs. So it's kind of some voodoo that I don't quite understand, but I just thought I would let you guys know. Um, uh, I'm just going to mention this one briefly as well, is that the, uh, there should be hat over that beta. Um, it's that the estimates, the ridge estimates, are not scale invariant. Um, so you should always normalize, well, not normalize, you should scale your regressors so that um, you get like little tilde xij is just the original value divided by and that that number is uh it's just a standard deviation of the jth regressor okay and okay now transition time so uh this this whole this pre-processing step applies as well to the least absolute shrinkage and selection operator now what is the least absolute shrinkage and selection operator well first of all we're gonna call it the lasso because that's uh, quite a bit more concise um, although I will say that the name actually, the name is, it does tell you quite a bit about what it does. Is that Absolute what Lasso stands for? Sorry, I, I never knew that before. Well, I'm glad one person learned at least one thing today. <laughs> because yes, I did not make that up. That would be, I would ah. be too clever if I made that up. Unfortunately, I'm just a person who can visit Wikipedia. Uh, that's all I can claim. Um, okay. So, um, so yes, yeah, so the Lasso estimator, uh, so it's a very similar routine to what we saw before. Um, we're trying to minimize RSS, but do something else at the same time, and that's sort of tame the absolute. So that's why it's the you know absolute shrinkage. Uh, the instead of the squared, right? We were squaring coefficients with the ridge regression. Now we're taking the absolute value, and it's it's the same thing. Uh, we got lambda there. So the only difference, again, is that instead of squared coefficients, we're looking at absolute value coefficients. Um, and so it shrinks them to zero. That's one difference. That's the most salient difference. That's the most remarked upon difference uh, between these two models, is that it will actually cause them to go to zero, exactly zero, as opposed to sort of asymptotically zero, um, and generates sparse models. So in the book, they, they make a bit of hay about these models being more interpretable, right? Which where interpretability just means fewer regressors. Um, and I just thought I would note kind of as a practical note, um, in GLMnet, um, again, this is, it seems to be like kind of a default package for fitting these types of models in R. Um, they actually do something, like this default is to do something that they don't really talk about in this, this book, which is to make mixture models. So where the penalty is actually some mixture. So you see one minus alpha here. And then this is basically the ridge part. It's a little bit different, but basically the ridge part. And you have alpha um, sort of um, lasso part. And so I just thought I'd mention that. So that would be something you'll see if you, uh, if you actually fit these models. Um, and, and yeah, and so, so I'm just trying to think. This is basically, I'm going to, again, time is of the essence, so I'm just going to kind of glide through this. But this is basically the same thing we saw with ridge regression, right? You see that as lambda increases, again, it's a shrinkage method. So you see coefficients generally shrinking. Now, I guess one thing to point out is that if you're, if you're, <laughs> someone wanted to test you and say, do they monotonically shrink? The answer would be no, or not necessarily. Because um, you do see that some grow as others shrink, and that will just depend on the correlations between the variables involved. Um, so, so yeah, so that's what happens to coefficients. Um, 
this is what an L1 norm is down here at the bottom. Um, Stromer people go into algebra. This was actually, I found someone, so it's Justin Grimmer. Is, that's not my name, by the way. My name's Justin, but my last name isn't Grimmer. Um, he is a, a political scientist who does machine learning stuff. And I found one of his assignments on his website. And, you know, me being a pathological person, I decided to do it. <laughs> this might not be one of his uh, Stanford PhD students, because, you know, life's not that good. But um, anyway, I thought this was a useful exercise, just plotting literally what happens to one coefficient in a ridge regression versus a lasso regression. And I think it's a, a nice illustration of here. You have this um, black bar, that's the OLS estimate. Just going along with the, I guess, parallel to the x-axis. And you see that, you know, the ridge regression kind of nicely glides towards zero, uh, whereas the lasso estimate, you know, it kind of body slams <laughs> into, into zero and stays there and is exactly zero. Um, so yeah, so the actual regression is not important, but it's a nice, nice illustration of the difference between the two in terms of what it does to coefficients. Um, and now, oh yeah, this was, I thought, really cool. Um, so in the book, I'll refer to the book, they bring up a different way of thinking about this as opposed to the, you know, the minimization exercise. So there's kind of like a, what I would call a such that formulation, formula, formulation, where you just say, I want to, you know, the same minimization of RSS as OLS, but subject to, and I hear these things at the bottom, in the case of the lasso, it's subject to, you know, the absolute values of um, the regress, uh, the, the parameters, not including the, not including the intercept, have to be less than some constant s. And what they show in the book, or what they state in the book, and I'm sure they show in the more advanced book, is that for each value of lambda, there's a corresponding value of s. So that's like a one-to-one -one mapping between these two. And what it does, and then okay, the same for the same for ridge. Um, but what it does is it creates this space of sort of allowable parameters. And here they do it with a, a two parameter model, uh, well, three parameter model, two explanatory variable model. And so you can see that, you know, here's the contour plot. So, um, you know, so like if you just did OLS, you get the, the beta hat estimate. But what you want to find is the, the first place where the beta hat estimate, uh, or sorry, well, I guess the residual sum of squares touches um, you know, the sort of acceptable space, which is determined by, by S. So I thought that was a, a really interesting way of looking at this. And I encourage people to look at the book to figure out more what these mysterious graphs mean. Um, this one I'm just going to skip over, uh, but there's, again, it's kind of one of these cool, amazing statistics things where somehow something that you wouldn't have expected to be something else turns out to be that other thing. And basically, uh, again, like, so I'm not going to go to this, but the, the gist of it is that if you set a Gaussian prior on the parameter estimates, um, that can, that will, then the, if you set a Gaussian, Gaussian, estimate, Gaussian prior on the betas, then the ridge estimate will be like the posterior. And if you set a double exponential prior on the estimates for beta, Again, centered at zero, um, you get the, the lasso estimates. And I said I wasn't going to mention anything, but it is cool that, you know, so you do see that they're both centered at zero, but there's a big peak for the one that corresponds to the lasso over here, the double exponential on the right. And if you look on the left, um, it's, you know, much smoother. So, so that's pretty cool. Um, and then this is just some throwaway comments at the end, uh, because, you know, how do you choose the best value of lambda, cross-validation? I don't have much more interesting, anything really interesting to say about that, um, because, you know, here it's just a very standard exercise. You get a grid of lambdas, you fit the model at each, you fit the model at each value of lambda, and you figure out which one minimizes the mean squared error. And that's, that's basically that. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else to point out here. I mean, again, black line is bias, green line is variance. Um, maybe on the right, it could be particular, potentially interesting to see that both ridge and lambda are similar, at least in this plot of R squared on training data against mean squared error. Um, they, they track each other pretty closely. Um, but I don't think there's anything that's gonna blow anybody's mind there. And here, 
I guess I'll just point out there's one interesting exercise they do in the book. So um, if we look at the bottom half here, so what they did was they they created a data set where that had I believe 50 predictors total, 48 being irrelevant. So just what they, they refer to as noise predictors. Um, and two predictors being actually relevant to the outcome. And they then ran it through the lasso algorithm to see you know, how lasso did. And you click on the, I guess what would be like the, the fourth panel here. Um, you see that the that the coefficients, like I mean, it does it does single out those two relevant predictors like very well and keeps the other predictors actually at zero. I even to the end, so the, the dashed vertical line would be the the value of lambda that you select that minimizes cross validation errors. So now it's in the, it depends whether you go row wise or column wise, so either the second or third. You know, it's a cross validation error uh, graph. So at that minimization of the cross validation error, you see that it effectively, the last algorithm does, you know, set the um, noise variables to zero and gives, gives non zero estimates to the relevant predictors. So that's pretty cool. That's a really interesting simulation exercise, I think. Um, but your mileage, your mileage may vary on that one. I don't know. But anyway, that's it. That's where I got to. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Well, you'd like nailed the time. So <laughs> that's that, that's uh, good work on figuring out, or I guess getting far enough. <laughs> um, that was very cool. That was a really great walk through. You know that part of the chapter. Um, I don't that know. That I felt that, that stung. That stung when you said part. Like that. Well, yeah. Well, the <laughs> through the yeah. Anyway. Um, so does anyone have any other thoughts so far in this chapter? Thank you, John. Anyone? All right, like I said, I will um, bring up in the uh, the chat uh, whether people want to meet next week or not. Um, I can't, but others might be able to. Um, and we'll sort things out from there. Um, so I will see everyone in January, and maybe you'll see each other next week. <laughs>